Also, guten Morgen, Gerhard. Guten Morgen allerseits. Und vielen Dank für diese Gelegenheit. Es tut mir leid, dass ich heute nicht persönlich bei Ihnen sein kann. Und jetzt werde ich auf Englisch sprechen. Außer wir erleben eine Zeitenwende. Who would have thought that Olaf Scholz would be the man to define this moment through which we are living? In one of the most famous speeches in William Shakespeare's play Twelfth Night, the servant Malvolio observes that some men are born great, some achieve greatness, while some have greatness thrust upon them. Olaf Scholz is clearly in the third category. But greatness seems to have been thrust upon him as Germany's leader and as one of the leaders of Europe at a time of momentous change. In English, we don't have very many words borrowed from German. Zeitgeist, Kindergarten, Weltanschauung, Schadenfreude. But now perhaps we have Zeitenwende. In these brief remarks to open this very, very important conference, I want to ask what kind of Zeitenwende is it? What is it a Zeitenwende from? And what is it a Zeitenwende to? And how can we make this a progressive turning point and not a regressive one? We are at the end, or we are coming to the end, of four eras of history. Let us start with the longest one. We are now in the final decades of the 250-year fossil fuel age. It was in 1776 that the Scot, James Watt, installed the first of his designs for the steam engine, which began the Industrial Revolution based on coal. Our economies in Europe, in the world, have been built on fossil fuel energy sources ever since. As we all know, we have to use the Ukraine crisis to accelerate the end of this period of human history. But there can be no doubt, whatever we do, that it is coming to an end. Not because, as we once thought, fossil fuels are running out. The Stone Age did not end because we ran out of stone. This era is ending because we have reached the thermodynamic limit that was always implicit in this new form of energy that humankind had discovered. The second law of thermodynamics, you will, I'm sure, remember, is the law of entropy, that matter and energy tends to disorder unless a new source of energy is applied to it. And so the concentrated carbon in coal and gas and oil had to be released into the disordered form of carbon dioxide. And it is humanity's misfortune that this causes global heating. There is no guarantee when humanity collectively will choose to end the use of fossil fuels, whether this will be by 2050, or earlier, but there is no doubt that we shall have to do so. The second era coming to an end is the 75 year long wave of Western Hemisphere's economic growth initiated after the Second World War. Economic growth, not just as a statistical phenomenon, but as the overarching goal of organized society. It was in the two decades after the war that annual economic growth as measured by the then new statistical concept of GDP or GNP, gross national product, um, as it then was, became the dominant purpose of Western states and exponential consumer spending growth, its crowning achievement. Economic growth was never the only goal of economic policy, but it was the primary one. For it was from this that all other goods were thought to flow. Full employment, improving public services, welfare spending, reducing poverty. For a while, it was even claimed that environmental improvement was correlated with economic growth. You may remember the famous environmental Kuznets curve that appeared to show this. That thought did not last long. Most of all, economic growth enabled the redistribution of income without excessively penalizing the rich, the perfect solution for democratic capitalism. This era is not ending because our societies are about to choose degrowth or a steady state economy or any of the other utopian ideals 
uh, of the green movement. But because the dream, the former reality, of a steady 2 to 3% annual increase in GDP is no longer available to us. We haven't had this since the 2008 financial crash, and we only had it beforehand because we were storing up the conditions for that crash. And no one expects it now. Whether you call this secular stagnation or just the unlucky coincidence of multiple crises, austerity, the COVID pandemic, now inflation, we are not about to enter a period of steady and sustained growth again. And as environmental disasters hit supply chains over the coming decades, as we have already seen in the last few years, we should not expect this era to return. The third period of history coming to an end is the neoliberal era, which began 40 or so years ago with the elections of Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, and which spread in milder form to almost all Western political economies. What a disaster this period has been, involving a huge transfer of wealth from labor to capital, from working people to the owners of assets. The twin processes of globalization and financialization, which characterize the neoliberal era, followed by quantitative easing over the last decade in an attempt to repair the crash which, which it led to, have seen the rich grow extremely rich and the extremely rich enter into a different world altogether. One that Russian oligarchs have uh, shown us a little uh, bit of recently. Meanwhile, regional deindustrialization and the growth of the casualized labor market, followed by austerity as the neoliberal utopia of financial de deregulation exploded in the financial crash, have left huge numbers of working people poorer and tax revenues insufficient to main improving, or in the UK's case, even decent public services. This era has already come to an end with governments having bailed out the private financial system from its own crisis in 2008, forced into huge public spending uh, on high levels of debt in the pandemic, and with deregulation, low taxation and the small state now having obviously nothing to say to the climate crisis. And then perhaps most obviously, we are, we are at the end of the 30 year era of post Cold War global security and trade. It is 30 years this year since Francis Fukuyama published The End of History and The Last Man, a much more subtle book than the cliched views most commentators now have of it, but still one which did declare that the Western liberal democratic capitalist countries had won the Cold War and the future was some version of this throughout the developed world. It has been an era of Western hegemony, of global trade and global supply chains, the dominance of the dollar and a little bit of the euro, of European economic and political integration centered on Germany. The invasion of Ukraine has obviously ended this era, but it had already ended with China's economic growth, its huge investment across the world in the Belt and Road Initiative over the last few years and forthcoming, and its new military assertiveness under Xi Jinping. So these four eras are coming to an end, or they have come to an end already, whether we like them or not. But what will come next, what the Titan vendor will turn to, is still to be shaped. Today, we're still living in the interregnum, famously described by Gramsci, when morbid, morbid symptoms appear. And the interesting question for us at this conference is how we would come out of the interregnum, as well as these four, four uh, eras of history, in a way that supports sustainable uh, welfare and prosperity, not just for our societies, in the northern industrial economies, but throughout the world. There is a dystopian future, which it is clear could emerge from this period. One in which Russian oil and gas are replaced by oil and gas and coal from other countries. And we do not accelerate the climate transition that is so obviously now available to us. One in which the politics 
of increased security concern leads to support for higher defence spending, but not for higher climate or welfare spending, in which debt limits are raised simply for the purposes of defence and not for human prosperity and well-being. One in which politics turns not to a greener, more hopeful future, but to a fearful future in which people react both to the security concerns that we now clearly face and to the environmental and climate security concerns that have still not fully entered our politics with fear, with xenophobia, and with a shift towards authoritarian uh, populist politics. We can clearly see this in many countries, uh, including the US, possibly in the UK, in Hungary and elsewhere already. But there is a more hopeful future too, and that is the one uh, in which uh, uh, we must engage uh, as a progressive political force within our societies. Uh, That is one in which we use the sense of a Zeitenwender, of a turning point, to bring about new eras in all four of these uh, fields. This would have a number of elements. Firstly, of course, it would see the accelerated phasing out of fossil fuels. The promise that we have been making since 2008 to 9, um, more powerfully since the Paris Climate Agreement, uh, Agreement of 2015, reiterated at COP26 just last year, um, which we have started on, but which we need to accelerate um, uh, uh, and to turn into the great economic transition of our time. Secondly, we will need a Green Deal, a green industrial strategy, financed not just by private sector investment, somehow de-risked by the public sector, but by public investment, um, both from sovereign debt, which we allow our central banks to finance, and from, in my view, equity stakes taken by the state in privatised investment, in private sector investment. Um, we think we need, as other speakers will uh, discuss in this conference, not just to de-risk the private sector, but to socialise some of the gains that the private sector will make in investment in the green transition, so that all of society shares in their profit. We will need a new deal, not just on the climate and environment, but on welfare and prosperity. The neoliberal era has seen a huge increase in inequality, particularly of wealth. And as I said, the casualized labor market, um, uh, particularly in the the UK and the US, um, has led to declining real incomes uh, for very large numbers of people. We will need higher minimum incomes. We will need stronger wage bargaining, particularly in those countries like my own, uh, in which it has declined. And we will need, it seems to me, Uh, uh, impossible to deny greater taxation of wealth. It is the increase in asset values, in wealth, which has been marked, so marked over the last 20 years and in particular over the last decade. And the only way we will finance uh, higher social spending, including climate spending, is to tax some of that more effectively. Um, It is the end of the period in which we could redistribute income and improve public services uh, without penalising the very rich. And they are going to have to uh, pay a larger share of these processes. Um, This is going to have to involve fiscal and monetary coordination, coordination. Uh, inflation targeting by independent central banks is clearly not enough um, at a time when uh, interest rates are so low um, to support our economies. Uh, We have already seen central banks financing uh, sovereign debt, um, uh, and we will need to see more of this in a much more sophisticated uh, coordination of fiscal and monetary policy. We will need, particularly in countries such as my own, which have seen, and in the United States, which have seen globalization lead to huge regional inequalities, we will need a much stronger regional uh, policies which would need to be attached to the just transition uh, industrial strategy to enable political support uh, to be won for that transition um, in areas which will be adversely affected as older energy intensive sectors um, are are gradually uh, and in a planned way uh, uh, declined. 
Um, and globally, we will need to see the kind of Marshall Plan for the Ukraine, which is going to be, one presumes, an inevitable part of uh, the next decade, applied also to other countries that are willing to enter into a green transition. Uh, the Belt and Road Initiative is a huge strategic channel uh, challenge to the West. Uh, to uh, uh, It is putting many countries in the developing world uh, under the security uh, umbrella, uh, uh, as well as the economic umbrella of China. And the West uh, needs to have an alternative to that uh, alongside the higher defense spending that we will have to make in order to protect ourselves uh, on the uh, Western European continent uh, from Russia and to deter uh, Chinese aggression, uh, potential aggression elsewhere. That is a global task which the US took on in uh, after the Second World War. We need an equivalent green, clean initiative. Um, what Joe Biden half said last year uh, at the G7, uh, the better Build Back Better World initiative, which can offer developing countries uh, a greener uh, future supported by northern uh, investment uh, and not one that simply depends on, on China. And lastly, we will need a politics of hope. Positive change has never been shaped by fear. It is very easy to be pessimistic uh, about the current situation. But as Gramsci also said, we need a pessimism of the intellect, but an optimism of the will. We have to find a positive, hopeful politics with which to talk the, the European people through this moment and into a, near, a new era in which the crisis of the Ukraine war, the crisis of climate change, the crisis of COVID, the crisis of financial destabilization, the crisis of inequality, these multiple continuous crises through which we have been living over the last decade and a half can be turned to a more hopeful future. That is what I hope and believe this conference today will do. Uh, and although I cannot join you for all of it, and I wish I was with you in person, um, uh, I believe you will be doing today. Thank you.